Radio Outcast is a wicked gunslinging podcast for mature audiences. Content warning. This episode contains depictions of violence, guns, character death, and blood throughout the episode that may be upsetting for some listeners. We encourage our listeners to prioritize their safety before venturing ahead. Thank you. Ugh. I mean, has there ever been a competent human? Or did I just end up with, like, the worst one? I mean, how unlikable do you have to be for Helix to not like you? I mean, that she manages to like any human is super beyond me, but... We're talking about the goddess who would drag me down to earth to watch every talentless, sad little musician over the centuries, and she cheered them on, no matter how grody they were. But if Charles doesn't, like, shape up, even Helix will catch on that he's a total fraud and listen more and more to that stuck-up man-child, Jesse Rogers. It's okay, Emmy. It's okay. For now, Helix is mega annoyed with that bucket And as for my little bumbling weirdo, Charles, I had some guys kidnap him so we can have a little, you know, chat. Mistress, you've chosen to corral with outlaws? <laughs> so, you had no clue. Not even a little itty bitty clue. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I. How would I? Sh- uh, should uh, I have? You are completely useless, Charles. Like, ugh. Start paying attention to everything. Okay? Because I've got a big problem now. And if I've got a big problem, then, like, you've got a big problem. (laughs) Remember that bullet? (laughs) So, there's a grody wrench thrown into the works, or whatever. That Jesse guy? Yeah. Not a part of the plan. I don't know who he is, or where he came from, but I need you to get rid of him. Or befriend him, something. Do I care? No, I need him out of the way. But it's clear to me, listening to your recordings, that he mad Major Mega totally despises you, or at least doesn't trust you. Aren't you supposed to be some like, master con artist my apologies emmy you are absolutely correct i Uh, should uh, uh. no i said pay attention don't talk listen okay now let's motor She took me inside her tent and instructed me to sit at a wooden table. Shortly after, one of the ruffians came in with her supper. A rough-eyed bandit serving supper to a lady. No doubt this was power. Power I do not quite understand. Not its source, nor the mistress's grand plans. The key is to make them love you. I've looked into your past. I know what you're capable of, Charles. Of course, Helix can be so mega difficult to love. That's why I'm doing all of this, you know. 
like these guys outside my tent, the ones who smell and look like shit. Do you think I really want to be hanging around with them? Like, barf. It's all part of the larger plan, yeah? As my mistress tells it, she found the outlaws not moments before they decided to rob a train. They seemed a perfect match for her mysterious plans. So I gave them the walkie-talkies. Do you know what walkie-talkies are? Ugh, never mind. And then let them go do their little heist thingy. As they explained it to my mistress, these bandits work for some mysterious figure in Texas. Oh, how inexorably I am familiar with Texan figures. Nevertheless, the outlaws emptied out every compartment in the train of wealth, killed the conductor, disconnected the engine, rode all the way to Tucson, put the engine in reverse, and watched as the leather-clad rangers chased after the empty vessel. Now, it was at that moment that the man-beast they call Ruthless was told by my mistress that he would be smart to join the rangers as one of their own and pretend to chase after his own gang. She told him when to kill the rangers, when he could rejoin his delinquent friends again, and when he and the others would capture me. Indeed, this was all part of her master plan. I made that whole little thing happen for them, and all they had to do was bring you to me. So like, duh. Do you get it? That's only one of the many reasons why they totally love me. And if you, Charles, care about not, you know, dying, that's what you gotta do. You gotta make her love you. Uh, not as a lover, or whatever, ew. You're definitely not her type anyway, but as a friend, a confidant, okay? Lucky for you, I know every trick in the book for getting into Helix's adorably naive good graces. So, she offered me information I had already come to understand. Helix is naive. She enjoys games. She is fond of parties and other merriment, but, but, most importantly, she craves recognition. <laughs> the latter I'd noticed myself, particularly today, with the way she bypassed my eager participation in her games to demand Jessie's. And what I need is to create an opportunity where she feels validated. If I can bring her that, then I will find myself in her favor. If I may ask one other question, mistress. <laughs> I mean, I guess. Uh, wh what do you suggest I do about him? I fear that even once I have convinced Helix of my usefulness that the cowboy she has taken as protector, Mr. Jesse Rogers, will never be persuaded. His distrust has been laid out to me in no uncertain terms. <laughs> I worry that he may deter my attempts and poison my image in Helix's mind. Helix is a god. Some stupid little human isn't going to get in her head. I'd tell you to just kill him. But, you know, the whole stolen immortality thing or whatever. Emmy smiled when she mentioned killing Jesse, as though it were a joke. However, he, he is an unexpected variable, a potentially dangerous variable, regardless of if my mistress realizes it or otherwise. Should have checked on her sooner. We'd been trotting along for miles without a sign of a giant black tower. Hadn't heard Helix open her mouth in over an hour. 
but I could still hear her walking behind me, dragging her feet. After some time, I turned and saw the state she was in. Her brow was furrowed in concentration as she focused on lifting her feet one at a time. This small young woman who called herself a goddess looked no steadier than a newborn calf. See? That right there is why we needed to get some horses. Fuck. Off. That little bird of hers flew around my head as I walked over to her. Seemed we were on the same page about old Helix. <sighs> Sit down. No. We, uh, we... We have to keep going. If we don't check on that shoulder of yours now, you'll be down and out by sunfall. <sighs> Fine. <sighs> Soon as she got off her feet, her face relaxed. Her shoulder wound had gone from red to blue and black. The impact point welled up like a bubble. I didn't know how to ask for the next part, so I just stared at her. What? I'd like to see your souls, if that's all right. She glared at me. It looked like she might tell me to go and never return, or like she might cry. Instead, she closed her eyes, chest heaving from the panic, and nodded. I was careful, raised her skirt only as far as I needed. Oh, where are your shoes? Uh, I, I couldn't find any in my size. Her feet were raw, red, and blistered all over. There were small cuts on her heels that needed cleaning. How the hell you gonna travel the desert barefoot? But she was already deep in the soup. No sense in that. Instead, I offered to carry her. The only way we'd make any progress. <sighs> oh. Um. <clears throat> uh. We need to find Charles. Yep. All right. Never have I ever walked the desert without boots. <laughs> uh, we could just talk. All right. Hmm. What do you want to know? Well, first off, what's that accent supposed to be? Michigan? Michigan? It's Kansas. Sort of. Been all over the place since I was little. <clears throat> My folks went up in Georgia. So, got a bit of that. Did a lot of cattle drives with my pa to Nevada, Texas. So, them too. So, your accent is more of a mixtape than an album? Uh... I guess. Okay. Next question. Why were you trying to rob that mayor? The one back in Lone Flats? Mm. That'd be the story of what happened to my dad. It's long. That's okay. Mm. Like I said, he was a cattle driver. One of the best. <clears throat> Must have been six years since it happened. He'd been shorthanded on a job. Just him, a friend, and three white men who said they were from Arizona. Similar faces. These men were chasing now. <clears throat> Soon the sun began to set. 
Emmy had hastened me out of her tent after our conversation. Now, I was sure Emmy had already devised some trickery to reunite me with my companions. I sat by the fire, a bowl of burnt beans in my hands, and waited. Now that my first objective has been completed, having located the otherworldly woman, my new mission is to follow Helix as she finds her towers and to report back our adventures. <sighs> Though the sun had receded, the ground was still warm from the day's heat. A few hours later, the freezing temperatures from the evening would set in. <coughs> <coughs> Those criminals <coughs> were the worst sort of company. In total, there were three. But, from the little I gathered of their conversation, there had once been twice as many. I didn't learn much else. Uh, soon, the two closest to me, uh, Burr Paxton and... Ruthless? <laughs> switched languages. It sounded French, not dissimilar to the sort I've heard in my travels through Louisiana, East Texas. Uh, so, too, did I notice that the third switched from English to Spanish when he spoke to Emmy. Now, I thought he must be Mexican, or, or at least accustomed to the language from experience and trade. It is no great secret that the southern states are plagued with looters who smuggle anything from gold to cattle. The only time these outlaws spoke in English was when Paxton called the Spanish speaker to inspect a map. It was then that I found possible answers to this Jesse dilemma. Rubio, Aaron, come take a look at this. Hmm, so that's the path Sam wants us to take. We needed a new base fast, and he delivered. You didn't think it'd be pretty, did you? Vogel and his goddamn puzzles. But I can get you there. I recognized the name at once. Sam Vogel. It was... After all, the only detail Jesse had let slip in a week. The only detail that marked him as a real person outside of just the vengeful cowboy, making my job more difficult than it had to be. And were I to have that map, then I would have the power. Most oh, certainly, yes. You with me, Paxton? Yeah. Mine's wandering is all. That dandy was with two others, and... I just can't get that cowboy's face out of my head. Must be a ghost or something. Maybe we robbed him. <sighs> you done eating those gross beans yet? Ugh. Humans and their eating. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Don't fuck this up for me, okay? I'm gonna bounce, cause, you know... This world doesn't deserve my Gorgina face, you know? Of course. And, Mistress, I do appreciate your... <laughs> yeah, whatever. Later. Do you think the god of death has a sense of humor, Mom? I know I was never around to meet him. Emmy met him, but she always said he was boring and not worth thinking about. I think he must have a sense of humor in order to do that job. It's gotta be fucked up. Like, hmm. Here's Jesse, right? He's a human destined to die like every other human. And his dad died, like they're all supposed to, but he died before Jesse thinks he should have. And now, here's Jesse, immortal. Took the kettle, and all they left behind were the bodies. Hmm. You know, they took his boots. Jackasses. Yeah, well... 
Soon as your old god shit's figured out, I'm back to looking for him. Gotta get each one of those assholes. When a human dies, and you love that human, it hurts. I... I know this all too well. It might be different, because I'm a goddess, and, and, and he was... Well, that's a different story. But it's the only death I've ever really known. Gods don't die. I'm barely starting to understand this mortality thing. But your dad... I'm sorry. It's just wrong what happened to him. Thanks. What about you? My parents? Um, that's a really, 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 really long story. Nah, how'd you end up how you are? Since you're a god and all. A short version? <sighs> well, my ex is a narcissist, and some people said I was bad at my job. What job is that? Walking barefoot? Ha, ha. No. Essentially, I am the god of sound. <laughs> That's music, wind through the trees, snap of a finger. Yeah, all of that. I made it. Hmm. Did you now? Yep. And Coda here, they're my familiar. They help me, uh, well, they keep my powers controlled. Every god needs a familiar to prevent their powers going whack. Beyond that, Coda is my best friend. So, you've all got birds in? Nah. Some gods use inanimate earth objects like a stopwatch or a cigarette or a walking cane. The only thing is, when you're on earth, you use an earthborn familiar. Like a bird. He adjusted how he was carrying me on his back and then cracked his neck. I was just about to ask him if he thought we should give up when he stopped in his tracks. I followed his eyes. Several yards away behind a skinny butte, there was a pillar of smoke. We kept silent as he got us closer. Luckily, the sun was setting over the back of the butte, so we were in the darkest spot of the desert floor. Jesse led us closer and closer, carefully measuring each option before sprinting a few yards at a time. Eventually, the baddies came into full view. Their faces were easy to see against their fire, and there, closest to the fire, huddled in on himself, was Charles. Are you gonna fight me if I leave you here? Don't. You. Dare. Figure. Can you walk? Just a little. <sighs> Thanks to Jesse giving my feet a break, I had a bit more energy in me and my shoulder had calmed down. Together, we took baby steps closer to the fire, trailing the shadows. I waited for Jesse's signal. It was exciting, honestly. I felt like a panther in the dark, hunting my prey. I kept expecting one of them to notice us, pull out a gun and just blow me to bits. But they didn't. They were too occupied with their food bowls and chewing tobacco. When the gang was just a few meters from us, Jesse tilted his hat. And then, we pounced. Shot the tall one through the skull before I thought anything through. He fell like a brick. His head smashing down into the fire pit. I turned the barrel toward the next one. The man I knew I knew. That's a face you don't forget. His eyebrows meeting in the center. A long scar across his chin. These were the guys. These were Sam Vogel's gang. They took my world from me. Now it was my turn to take theirs. Holy 
Holy fuck! You actually shot him? It was then that my head caught up with my hand. I looked at the body, my finger on the trigger, and I remembered that I was supposed to be better than this. I was supposed to look these rats in the eyes I took them out of this world so they knew who it was that done them in. I wasn't supposed to sneak through the shadows and shoot a man while he ate dinner. I'm better than a dirty fat. Fuck. What are you doing? The chintz guard man turned his head and spotted us. You fucker! You killed my brother! Keep shooting! Nope. No. Don't keep shooting. Osgood runs from the fire but gets grabbed. Release me at once! What would... J Jesse! Jesse! This one! This is the man you want! Shoot him! I heard them! They're Smithy Vernaculars gang or whatnot! He knows you! Shut up! Drop the gun, or your friend's dead. A clear shot, but I hesitated. I can't. Oh, for the love of... Rogers, they are murderers! Robbers! Blood-soaked degenerates! Your precious code is tenfold fulfilled. Now, please, do it! Osgood's grin is practically manic. The guy's beaming at me as he finds a loophole for my code for me. Maybe if it had been anyone else, that wouldn't have been enough. But right then, it was. My dad, his friends, the rangers, and every other soul they'd taken. Osgood was right. Maybe I could kill them. The scales were already tipped against them. Enough! <gasps> the chin scarred man shot me in the stomach. Then again, inside, a familiar sting in both areas stunned my body with pain. Blood poured from the wounds, but it never blossomed. Muscle pushed the bullets out from my body, and then my skin stitched itself back together. The pain is brief. The shark lingers, but I won't die. I won't even have a scar. Again, I heal. Look back up at them to take aim, but they've thrown Oscar towards the fire and started running to their horses. No, they don't want to fuck with the undead man. I get one through the knee as they try to mount their horses. He falls, but his friend catches him and pushes him on. I run after him and keep shooting. They get away, but they left their loot, a horse, and the one bastard I shot will bleed out before they get anywhere. Charles! My summer coat is utterly ruined. <sighs> Helix checked on Charles while I checked the dead outlaw for clues. Figured there might be clues that might lead me back to Sam Vogel's latest hideout. Nothing. When I turned back to Helix and Osgood, they were skulking around through the gang's loot. Mostly bonds and other shit that'd be more trouble than it was worth to take. Told him we should leave anything that might pin us to the gang's crimes. That left us with quite a bit of loose change. Most importantly, a free horse. Think I'll make it mine. Osgood. <coughs> How'd you know about all their crimes? <coughs> they poured their hearts out to you? You going among the willows with him now? Oh, yes, of course. That one you shot especially enjoyed chatting about his favorite custard recipe. What a ridiculous accusation. I simply overheard him say he knew your face, and then the name, oh, uh, Samson Varner Gang, or whatnot, came along. It's Sam Vogel, you fool. Can the arguments wait until after I've got my power back? 
<clears throat> Here, Charles, take the Walkman. Won't work without you anyways. Thank you. We followed the machine's ramblings just behind the butte of the camp and found the tower. The damn thing had been right under our noses. A tall black obelisk waiting for us in the shadows. Helix hobbled her way over to the tower despite me offering help. But she insisted. Me and Osgood watched from the butte as she studied it. She put her hands up against the tower and waited. Seems nothing happened. She tried it a few more times. Watched Helix go from intrigued to rambling, confused to airing her lungs out. <laughs> she stormed around in the moonlight like a child, kicking up dirt. Then she looked up at me and just stared. Her eyes were all wide and mouth going open. Started walking forward and she waved me off. Next thing I know, Helix is pinching a shoulder wound. Fuck, this hurts. How came she so, huh? Has she gone vazy since my time apart? <laughs> no. Oh. <sighs> Helix squeezed her wound until blood came pouring out. She covered her hands with it and then went back to the tower. A few seconds later, she was jumping up and down and ran back, talking about some power that lets her know and speak all languages. If all of these fucking towers only give me one fucking power at a time, how much longer is a stupid fucking quest gonna take? Oh, we're gonna be stuck together for a while. <sighs> Not your fault. We'll figure it out. <sighs> Osgood didn't have much to add to the conversation. He just kept to himself. Plucking at the dust in his powder white air. Only two reasons a man has gone quiet. He's got nothing to say, or he's hiding something. And trust me, Osgood's always got words to say. He didn't speak up till Helix asked him if he could teach her to play card games. I noticed he hadn't been tied when we found him. In fact, when I went to check the body, found a servant of food where Osgood had been sitting. Why would those good-for-nothings treat him as a guest? But Helix was right. We need him. But if my instincts are right, and Charles Osgood, or whoever he really is, gets in my way, cold be damned, I'm driving six rounds through his heart. And you know I will. Radio Outcast was created by Maria Fernanda Vidalrosaga and J.T. Lachese, and produced by Anne Hughes, starring Daniel A. Stevens as Charles Osgood, Anne Hughes as the voice of the Sunny Machine and Emmy, Ivory Amor Di Francisca as Jesse Rogers and Aaron Rubio, Jay Duong as Helix, Daniel Sotelo as Coda, and Griffin Otto Deniger as Burr Paxton. This episode was written by Fernanda, directed by Fernanda, with dialogue editing by Anne, sound design by JT, and music by Samuel Kinsella. Special thanks to my neighbor Nate for helping me get back into my apartment after I locked myself out in the middle of sound designing this episode. As always, you can find us online at RadioOutcast.com, or follow us on Instagram at RadioOutcastPod, and Twitter at Radio underscore Outcast. If you like what you hear, let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or Good Pods. It helps us reach more listeners and gives us a chance to see what you all think of the show. If you'd like to help us grow, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash radio underscore Outcast. Our patrons get access to behind-the-scenes material, original scripts, and bonus content, including newspaper clips of an assassination attempt on President Cleveland 
and scandalous letters written by the illustrious Miss Marigold. If you become a patron at the Coda tier, for as little as $1 a month, you too could get a special shout-out at the end of our episodes, such as Kyrie O. The Wildfire Stephanie C. The Long Shot Gnome H. The Bog Trotter Pat C. The Pinocchio Man Alan L. The Steel Blood Dan W. The British Invasion Melissa L. The Poker Face Sarah F. The Miracle Tooth Rax W. The Range Whisperer Marcos L. The Lone Doctor Patricia D. The Dynamite Eye VCA Staging The Phantom Friend Lisbeth S. The Gold Viper Val V. The Evening Gun Juan P. The Kid with a Plan Andy S. The Sunrise Wolf Aaron B. The Great Lasso Mr. Physics The Dawn Rider Susan D. The Second Life Fearless Lila Rose 300 The Big Courage Chelsea S. The Good Egg and Sebastian the Hazard Machine To all of our patrons, thanks again. We appreciate you. To everyone listening, safe travels.